The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. When Jesus had cast out a devil, some of the people said, It is true, Beelzebub, the prince of devils, that he casts out devils. Others asked Jesus as a test for a sign from heaven. But knowing what they were thinking, he said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is heading for ruin, and a household divided against itself collapses. So too with Satan. If he is divided against himself, how can his kingdom stand? Since you assert that it is through Beelzebul that I cast out devils, now if it is through Beelzebul that I cast out devils, through whom do your own experts cast them out? Let them be your judge then. But if it is through the finger of God that I cast out devils, then know that the kingdom of God has overtaken you. So long as a strong man fully armed guards his own palace, his goods are undisturbed. But when someone stronger than he is attacks and defeats him, the stronger man takes away all the weapons he relied on and shares out the spoil. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, it wanders through waterless country, looking for a place to rest, and not finding one, it says, I will go back to the home I came from. But on arrival, finding it swept and tidy, it goes off and brings seven other spirits more wicked than itself. And they go in and set up house there, so that the man ends up by being worse than he was before. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Well, we continue our reading from Galatians, this incredibly exciting text. Aren't you learning things that you didn't quite think about Amen. or maybe thought about and didn't quite have a clarity about it? What's the relationship between the law and faith? What's the relationship between our practices that we do, our devotions and all of the things that we do and faith and justification, which is being declared just before God? and salvation, which is coming to be one with God in the day when he takes us to be with him in heaven, where we get to see him as he really is. What's the relationship between sanctification and justification? One is how we begin justification as we stand right before God, and sanctification is how we grow in our life of grace and allow God to be God for us. So sanctify, to be made holy, is what the role of the Spirit is in our life. The Spirit justifies through baptism, but sanctifies through the course of our life as we become holy before God, as we yield our heart to his heart, our will to his will. Paul is taking on the big and thorny issues of the day. And I, I thank God for the Judaizers. Because if the Judaizers weren't so foolish as to proclaim a gospel in, to, in Paul's territory that was really not what was being taught, then we would not have had the, this wonderful letter of the Galatians. And, and we would not have had the, the clarity Paul picks up some of these themes in Romans in a much more mature and developed way. But we, we see the development between here and Romans because here he really gets the later. In Romans, he kind of, of polishes it up and makes it look nice and pretty. But, but here in our text today, we've come to one of the, the, the crucial moments where Paul lays down his theological argument. So before he, he, he talks about what it is to, why it is he has a right to speak, because God called him. What it is God is saying, that it is justification through faith alone, not by the works of the law. Why he believes that, we saw that in, in Galatians 2.16, where he spells this thing out. And then in, in Galatians 3, we saw the application beginning now 
where, where he talks first about why justification through faith is important and then that he confronted Cephas on this fact. And why is it important? Because there was an agreement on this, that he went to Jerusalem and submitted his teaching to them. And now we have our text today. And, and in our text, Paul is now laying out the argument based on a reference to what we would call the Old Testament, what he would have called the Jewish scriptures. So he's using the Jewish scriptures to lay his argument out and, and to demonstrate that what he is saying is consistent within the Jewish tradition. And it is, it is not only consistent, but it is, it is an interpretation that was there from the beginning if one had the eyes to see. But he's also saying it is only through faith in Jesus Christ that we could have the eyes to be able to see this and to bring this teaching for everyone. So let's go with this text. He starts, don't you see that it is those who rely on faith who are the sons of Abraham? Scripture foresaw that God was going to use faith to justify the pagans and proclaimed the good news long ago when Abraham was told it in the passage, it will be blessed. In all you, sorry, in you, all the pagans will be blessed. So Paul is playing with words here. He says, scripture foresaw what God was going to do to use faith to justify the pagans and proclaim the good news. The good news is the gospel and proclaim the gospel. So he's saying that back in Genesis, God proclaimed the gospel that through Abraham, all the pagans will be blessed. So he's referring here to Genesis 12, 3 where it says, through you shall all the nations be blessed. And the nations are, are all the Gentile world. So not just the Jewish people will be blessed through, through Abraham, but also the whole people, all living people, will be blessed through, through Abraham. And, and in, in saying this back in Genesis, Genesis 12, 3, Paul is claiming that in Genesis 12, 3, so at the very beginning of this incredible odyssey of faith that we are traveling, at the very beginning, God already intended to bring redemption through Abraham for all the nations. And that's why it says, through you, all the nations will be blessed. So Paul is laying his first foundation that the blessings given to Abraham are not only for the Jewish people. The blessings given to Abraham were given for all the people. And if we, if we hear that, then you understand that the Jews who believe that everyone must become a Jew to find the blessings of God. Now Paul is undoing that and saying, no, 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 no. All the blessings that God gave to Abraham, all of them will be given to the nations because all the nations will be blessed through Abraham. He doesn't say how, but all the nations will be blessed through Abraham. So it goes on to say, those therefore who rely on faith receive the same blessing as Abraham, the man of faith. So now he, he's, he's going that, that the way that they the pagan nations received the blessing is by being like Abraham, the man of faith. Now, you have to remember, so also in Genesis 15, 6, it says, Abraham put his faith in Yahweh, and this was reckoned to him as righteousness. This is Genesis, said. this is not the New Testament, this is the Old Testament. Abraham put his faith in Yahweh, and this was why he was right, rendered righteous, or at right with God, or standing right in the court of law, not being condemned by God. So the Old Testament already speaks about faith as a reason why Abraham was being justified. And we know that because in, in this text we see that the law 
comes long after. The circumcision covenant and the whole burden of the law comes long after Abraham was found at right with God. And this is the argument that Paul is making, that Abraham wasn't found righteous with God because of circumcision, because of the covenant, and because of the law. But it was because Abraham was found right with God through his faith, Genesis 15, that the covenant, the circumcision, and the law becomes the sign of that being at right with God, and the sign that he is the chosen and favored one of God. And so he's using arguments to show that the Old Testament already is speaking the language that we need to speak about Jesus, redemption, salvation, and justification. Paul introduces the quotation of Genesis by declaring that the scripture saw in advance that God would justify the Gentiles by faith. God saw beforehand that that is how the Gentiles would be justified. But we go on and he says, on the other hand, those who rely on keeping the law are under a curse, since scripture says, curse be everyone who does not preserve, persevere in observing everything prescribed in the book of the law. Phew. So what he's saying here is this. If you want to be justified by observing the law, you have to observe every dot, every stroke, every bit of the law. You, you can't observe 99.99999% and consider yourself to be upright or righteous or justified before the law. So anyone who wants to be justified by observing the law must ensure that they observe 100% of the law. And if not, the scripture says, a curse is a man who does not observe the whole of the law. So we are, we are being presented with two ways now to God. One, by faith, we could be counted righteous, or by the law, we could also be counted righteous, but we will have to observe every bit, piece, dot, cranny of the law. And nothing could be left out. And, and that was impossible. And Paul understood this, and the Jewish people understood this. And that was a constant squibble because the Pharisees wanted complete observance of the law. And to be able to do that, they had to have all kinds of slaves and servants to do all kinds of things for them so that they could observe the law while their servants and their slaves were unable to observe it because they were working for them to observe the law. And, and, and therefore, Paul is saying, no. If you want to go with the law, go with the law, but know that if you don't observe all of it, you'll be cursed. If you want to go by faith, go by faith. But faith is why Abraham was considered justified by God. So he's laying the argument. But, but it's an incredible argument. So hold on, hold on. He says, the law will not justify anyone in the sight of God, because we are told the righteous man finds life through faith. The law is not even based on faith, since we are told the man who practices these precepts finds life through practicing them. He's using two other texts of scripture now, and, and this is where he really gets interesting, because he's using Habakkuk 2.4, when he says, behold, he whose soul is not upright in him shall fail, but the righteous shall live by his faith. The righteous shall live by his faith. And then Leviticus, which says, you shall therefore keep my statutes and my ordinances by doing which a man shall live. So again, he's contrasting. Do you want to live by the law? Then observe all of it. Do you want to live by faith? It is through faith that the righteous, that, the, that the, we will be considered righteous. And now he, he flips the argumentation now. And in flipping the argumentation, he, he goes to Christ and says, Christ redeemed us. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by being cursed for our sake. 
since scripture says, curse be everyone who hangs on a tree. Paul is amazing, you know. I don't know about you all, but this, this is a tongue twister. Huh? But just keep following me. The scripture says, curse be everyone who hangs on a tree. So Christ hung on a tree. Christ was accursed. Because Christ was accursed, not by God, but by human beings, Christ was able to take our curse as human beings and redeem it, is Paul's argument, which is his next line. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by being cursed for our sake. Since scripture says, curse be everyone who hangs on a tree. This was done so that in Christ Jesus, the blessings of Abraham might include the pagans. Because Christ makes himself into a curse for our sake, we who have been cursed now can be considered righteous before God. In other words, because Christ took the full pain, weight, and debt of sin unto himself for our sake, we have all been redeemed by Christ because we now have been freed because he already paid the price for our salvation and we are only justified through faith in Jesus Christ. I want you to notice two things here. First, how Paul is reasoning his way through the Old Testament, which is a, a, quite amazing in itself. But second, the reason why Paul sees the cross as central to all salvation. Without the cross of Jesus Christ, the price for our being a curse would not have been paid. Because Christ took the full weight of the cross, the curse of the cross, onto himself, we who have been accursed now through him have been found righteous before God. So Paul sees that the only way through to salvation is through the cross of Jesus Christ. And that's why you'll see all through Paul the cross figuring large as life, center, square, everything he says. But there's one other thing that he says. He says, Christ Jesus the blessings of Abraham might include the pagans. And so that through faith we might be given and receive the promised Holy Spirit. So through the death of Christ, we have been redeemed through faith. And that's how we receive the promise of the Holy Spirit. Paul is doing a very tight logic reason. Sometimes it might be hard to follow. But at least follow this, that we cannot find salvation through the works that we do. We cannot find salvation through trying to be an upright person. We don't find salvation through our devotion to God. We can't make up for our sin sickness because we try to be nice, civil, politically correct, honest, upright, and, and, and endearing to all people. That's not how we find salvation. That's how we find public notoriety, but it's not how we find salvation. Nothing that you do, nothing that you can ever offer, nothing, nothing, nothing can allow you to become righteous before God. It is only through the cross of Jesus Christ where Christ paid the price for your salvation. It's only through that that you can now be found righteous before God. And it is because you are found righteous through faith that God gives to you the Holy Spirit. And that gift of the Holy Spirit is what is more precious than everything else. So Paul is pulling together his theology here. And what, he, what he's saying is this. That sometimes we believe that we could pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. Sometimes we believe if we do a little more of this and a little more of that and a little more of the other, we'd be okay. And that's all a lie. It's one big, fat, huge lie. We cannot save ourselves. Salvation comes only through Jesus Christ. And it is only through Christ that we can find salvation. And through salvation, we are given the Holy Spirit. And through the Holy Spirit, we can be sanctified to become holy people. And that's the message of Paul. 
And it's a very provocative message because we live in a day of self-help where we believe that we could pull ourselves up and make ourselves better. We can't. We can, through faith, be redeemed and through grace be sanctified. Amen.